Hello, Detroit. <laughs> My name is Greg Gage. I'm a neuroscientist. And what a neuroscientist means is someone that went to uh, school for uh, many, many years, six and a half years of graduate school, just to get a chance to be able to study this. This is the brain. And the reason why you have to go to graduate school is because they don't teach this in high school or even in undergraduate. You actually have to go to a research university to get the tools and technologies to be able to actually understand a little bit how the brain works. You know, and that's a, that's a shame because there's one out of five, that's 20% of everybody in Detroit, everybody in the world will be diagnosed with a neurological disease. So shouldn't we be teaching some of the tools a little bit earlier in education so people can actually know about this career so they actually come out and like solve some of these diseases? It's not like this in other types of sciences. For example, in uh, astronomy, you can just go out and buy a cheap telescope. Uh, you don't need to have a PhD just to sit in your backyard and understand a little bit about how the heavens work, and then maybe you become interested in becoming an astronomer, you know, but it's not like that in neuroscience. It's not like that in any of the biological sciences. And so uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, uh, my lab mates and I would always get together, and we would go out and we would try to change that. We would go into schools, we would try to teach a little bit about how the brains work. And so you can see we would make a, a paper mache Frankenstein, which had an ice cream brain, and one student would scoop out part of the brain, and we would transfer that lesion to another student. So if he scooped out like the visual cortex, we would put like blinders on the other kids. So they learn, okay, the visual cortex. You know, it's responsible for vision. And you can do the same thing with the motor cortex, and you can tie a kid's arm down. So they understand a little bit about parts of how the brain works, but not actually getting at the core, the essence of what it is that we are, like what is it that it makes our brains actually work. Uh, so uh, one of my lab mates, uh, Tim Marzullo, and I decided that we were going to do something about this. We wanted to actually make the university-grade equipment and bring it into the school so the kids could actually see what the brain actually does. And so we started this project, well, we called it the $100 spike, and the idea was uh, it was a self-imposed engineering challenge. Uh, we put an abstract in for a scientific conference in March. The conference was in November, and so we had all summer, and we worked and worked and worked, trying to be able to re replicate $40,000 worth of lab equipment with a budget of $100. Uh, and so we went to the conference, and here we are. That's uh, my lab mate, Tim Marzullo, on the right, and that's me on the left. Uh, and we had showed what we had. It actually wasn't even uh, that functional yet. But people kept coming up to us and asking us more questions about it. Uh, so here's a close-up of it. It's, you can see it's like a cinder block with some um, wood and, and screws on there to hold an electrode. We had a, like a raw circuit. Um, but the feedback was incredible. And so we, we thought about it. We said, hmm, you know, no one really cares about the research we're doing, but everyone seems to like the side project. Maybe we should be thinking about the side project. So we did that. We actually formed a company. We called it Backyard Brains. And we started with the prototype that you can see on the far left. And we kept building and building and building it over the next year. And what we came up with was this. Actually, uh, <laughs> hey, Bill, <laughs> can you bring up that stack of stuff that I left back there? <laughs> and bear, one moment, please. So what we built was a, a, what's called a spiker box. And it looks like this. And what it allows us to do, perfect, thank you so much, mate. Awesome. It would have been a pretty lousy demo without this. All right. <laughs> All right. It looks like this, and it allows you to record living brain cells from within your, within, uh, like your brain. So these are neurons, li like living brain tissue. And we could do that, and, and we wanted to be able to do it in the high school classroom, so we didn't want to bring in racks of equipment, so we allow students to use their own phones, and they're, you're going to be able to actually see what the brain signal looks like, okay? And so we're not going to use, uh, I'm going to do a demo right now, uh, but I'm not going to use uh, my brain. Uh, I'm going to use the brains of cockroaches. And so about, uh, before I go into that, let me just explain a little bit. Do you guys understand how the brain works? Because... The problem is we don't teach neuroscience in, in, in high school or in, in grad, until you get to graduate school. So I just want to give a, qu a, quick, a quick primer on this. Uh, so this is one cell of the brain. This is called the neuron. The neuron has a long arm. It's got a specialized cell, and we call that arm an axon. And that axon does something special. It sends an electrical message from one cell to another. And we call that a spike. And this is the common currencies of the euro of the brain in which everything sort of like flows in from the outside world out back 
out to your muscles. And so we're going to use the brains of a cockroach. And so I have some right here. And so these guys live in South America. They're pretty cool. So as you can see, he's uh, alive. And one of the things we need to do is we need to use living brain tissue. I'm going to put him into ice water right now. So what we teach, whoopsie. Get in there. So one of the things that we teach when we, when we do neuroscience is the ethics of using animals. And so we always want to anesthetize anything that we're going to do surgery on. And in a few moments, I'm going to do surgery on this guy. And what we're going to do is, uh, I'm, when I've lowered him into the, the water, what's happening is that it's, uh, it's uh, when things get colder, things slow down. And so when they slow down, ion channels can't move. And when ion channels can't move, you can't cause spikes. And so therefore, not only is uh, the neuron stop firing for pain, but you can also stop moving. So I'm going to put it in here. I'm going to come around to the other side so we can do the surgery next. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, a pair of scissors and I'm going to cut off one of his legs. And the reason why we have to do that is because I said when, the ne when he's cold, the neurons turn off, right? And so we want to be able to record these neurons. So we're going to cut off one of his legs. And there's a couple of questions I'm going to answer about this. Number one is that these legs can grow back. Uh, and then number two is this leg will continue to stay alive. And that's because cockroaches are so much cooler than us uh, and they can breathe through their skin. So therefore, if I cut your leg off, your leg would die. But if I cut this leg off, it will still stay alive. And the reason why is because it can still breathe. And so let's take a look, if we, if we go back to the slides. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this experiment that we're going to do. So inside the leg, they have all these beautiful hairs here. And each hair has a neuron in it. And that neuron's job is to send information back to the brain about vibrations in the ground or maybe in the air as things flow by. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to basically stick two pins into the leg and, they're, and then they're going to pick up this electrical signal and we're going to amplify it and be able to listen to it, what the brain sounds like. And I'm talking about the, the, these neurons are still living in this leg, but you have to imagine this is the exact same neurons that in your, in your brain. We have 100 billion cells called neurons. These cockroaches have one million, but each neuron individually looks exactly the same. I'd be hard pressed to tell you which one was which, if it was a cockroach or if it was a human brain by looking at it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this uh, guy. I'm going to plug in the pins here. Put one in here. And so the nice thing about this prep is that it always works, so, except for when you're doing it live in audiences, so we'll see. Okie-dokie, there it goes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this guy on. Let me make sure this other pin is in. So we're, now we're going to be listening to what the brain sounds like. I want everyone to take a listen. So what does that sound like? It sounds like I hear people say it sounds like chicken drops. Or some people say it sounds like uh, pop popcorn or, or bacon popping. And so what I'm going to tell, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to take a, uh, a little thing from Starbucks. I'm going to touch the leg, and you're going to see if you hear a, 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 a change, okay? You guys hear that? So this is actually what your brain sounds like. So if you were to listen in, if you put stick a wire into your head right here and, and amplify it, you're going to actually hear this sound right here. This is the sound of those neurons. So I'm going to go grab this cable. I'm going to see if we can plug in the iPad, because we wrote this software for the students to be able to actually record it and collect data as well. You can get the iPad up. I can't see what you guys are seeing. Hopefully you're seeing the iPad. You guys see the iPad? No. Can we get the iPad up? Well, did you see this camera? We're cool? All right. Let's watch the movie. So those poppings you're seeing are actually one neuron communicating to another neuron. So this is happening inside your brain right now. But I want to talk about one more experiment we can do. This is actually pretty cool. That, 
when I touched the leg, you saw an increase in rate, and this is called rate coding. It takes a long time in neuroscience to do, but now students can do this in the fifth grade and actually learn a little bit about the brain. But I want to do one more experiment, and that is here. Uh, we're going to take a look at how the brain now sends information back out. But actually, let's look at the data first. So this is the data. Are we on the slides? I can't see what's on there. So in the upper right corner, you can see those spikes we saw. We published papers so that teachers can understand what we're doing. In the lower left, you can see when someone touches the leg, you can see that increase in spiking. That's what those arrows are. But without even looking at the arrows, you can just look at the spike train. That's information that's coming into the brain. And this is cool because it's extremely portable. Uh, and so we can bring it anywhere. So this is in, in Detroit. Uh, we showed, I love this picture because this kid has seen what his brain sounds like for the very first time. That is not a stage photo. He's actually excited, and this happens over and over and over again. So kids are becoming interested in neuroscience. It's also very portable, so we can bring it anywhere. As we get citizens involved, this is a, uh, a, an airplane flight we took from California to Michigan, where the stewardess gave us some ice to knock out the insect. We put up a sign, seats 33A and B, neuroscience lesson. We gave lessons for four hours. It was, it was incredible. And so we've given this to 27,000 people have seen that what the brain sounds like just because of this invention. And not only is it us that's doing it, but the people, the students are bringing it home and telling their friends and their friends, and it's great to see this community sort of growing. But we're going to try to redo one more experiment. We have from the, uh, we were walking at information coming up to the brain, and now we're going to look at information coming back down because we know that our muscles move also through spikes and it does it through electricity. We're not the first people to do this experiment. In fact, uh, a guy named Galvani did this many, many, many years ago in the 1700s, and he found that if you stimulated a, uh, a frog leg with electricity, that actually would, would move, right? And so he hooked up lightning rods and hooked up and captured the lightning rod, also captured the frog, uh, put it into the frog leg, and he found out that the electricity that is out there in the world is the same that's inside this body. So we're gonna do that same experiment. We're not gonna use lightning rods. What we're gonna use is we're going to use a, uh, an iPod. And so you may not know this, but there's magnets inside your earbuds, and those magnets move because of electrical current that shakes, all right? And so what we're going to do is we just cut off the ends. This is our biggest contribution to science, uh, is this jumper cable. I'm going to load up a song here from Detroit, and I'm going to place it on here. Can we get the camera on? I'm just going to hook this guy up to here, and this guy up to here. And if this works, okay. Can you guys see that? Is it hard to see? Are you on the camera? Take a look at this leg right here. So what's happening is that the electrical current is coming down through that muscle and it's causing it to move. And you're going to notice that it actually happens to the beat. So as the, as the electrical current flows through that muscle, it causes a charge, which causes those neurons to fire, which causes that leg to move. And so this is actually something that uh, is actually pretty um, exciting for kids to actually understand a little bit about how the brain now communicates with the muscles. And we can also do this with other animals as well. S squid are amazing because they can change their colors very quickly. And they do this because their brain controls what their skin looks like. And so here's a video we made where we zoomed in onto a patch of squid cells. And we we're going to play some music. Can you put the sound up? So this is, this is now you're looking at like from the neurons that control the muscles inside each one of these things called chromatophores. You can actually see these brown, these pink, and these yellow pigments sort of dancing to the music. It's because that low bass frequency is what actually is causing those, those muscles to actually contract. So you get this illusion that's like almost like dancing to the music. It's almost like a beautiful uh, biological screensaver. All right, now uh, for our final experiment, we've already seen two. Our final experiment, we're going to um, talk about something brand new. This is uh, the RoboRoach. And uh, it, we're, we're unveiling it for the first time today at TEDx Detroit. Uh, so our latest prototype, we had a Kickstarter uh, that was recently funded successfully. And so we built the prototype. And I'd like to build, bring Bill on stage right now. And we're going to do the first live demonstration of our uh, final version that we're going to ship to customers. But before we do that, let me explain a little bit what, what it does. Uh, when a cockroach is walking down the street, and he has his antennas up. He uses this to sort of sense where he is. And if you were to touch one of his antennas, it would turn and walk in the other direction, right? Because this is one of the re reflexive responses that a cockroach has. So if he's walking this way, you touch the right one, he'll turn and walk to the left. 
And so then what we can do is we can take the, um, the same thing that we saw in the very first experiment, right? Each antenna has hairs on it. Those hairs are picking up touch sensors. They're also picking up chemo sensors, like big noses that are up there, but it uses it for this navigation. So what would happen if we were to stick an electrode inside the uh, antenna, and instead of that neuron firing because it touches something, what if we put a tiny little puff of current that caused that neuron to fire? The brain would receive that information and actually think that something touched it, and then it should actually respond in its behavioral manner. So Bill, are you back there? Don't leave me hanging, bro. <laughs> this is Bill. He's one of the, uh, the, uh, the product engineers on here. He's developed this new experiment. So now we're going to see for the very first time. So now he's turning like, now if you notice, the light is coming on in the opposite direction. And so what the cockroach thinks is that something is touching it. So it's going to try to avoid that. And so this is a technique that we're actually experimenting. It's the exact same thing that's being used in deep brain stimulation for, cure, like for Parkinson's disease or for cochlear implants for, like for deafness. And we're actually giving this to high school students so they can actually learn a little bit about these neurotechnologies early on so they can actually think about going into neuroscience. All right, so there it is. This is the world's first commercially available cyborg in the history of all of mankind. And it came out of Detroit. <laughs> Good job, Bill. <laughs> All right, he's a star. I just want to uh, just finish up as, with really quickly just, just talk about what, where we're going with this. We started this uh, about two or three years ago uh, in Michigan. We are now in all 50 states. We are in 51 countries on seven continents, including Antarctica. And we're soon going to be on the International Space Station. And so the goal of what we're doing here is trying to make these neuroscience tools that are typically only taught in grad school into the hands of everybody so that tomorrow's neuroscience will learn this today and bring about the neural revolution. Thank you.